Hey, congratulations. You're watching the fastest growing fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. In today's episode, we talk to first responders. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened in today's episode, but before I do, let me remind you to like this video, share it with your friends, uh, turn on your notifications. Oh, and by the way, leave a comment. If you're one of the first 30 comments underneath and we like your comment, we'll pick it as the best one. This is what you get. Look at this beautiful shirt. It's a mind pump shirt um, proven to add pounds to your bench press and deadlift and make you leaner. Uh, some of that is not true, but the true part is you do get this amazing t-shirt. Okay, so in today's episode, we're talking about first responders, the specific demands that they place on the body, how they need to work out to be better at their jobs, and also just look hot and sexy. I know as a first responder, you probably already are hot and sexy, but you can look even hotter and sexier by following our advice. Speaking of which, we've put together a workout bundle of different workout programs specifically for first responders. It's called the First Responder Bundle, which includes MAPS Prime, MAPS Performance, MAPS Strong, and MAPS OCR. All of them a little different, all of them applicable to first responders. Now, normally, if you got all these programs at retail, it would cost you over $500, but not today, not for you. You're lucky. You get them all for $159.99. That's it. One payment of $159.99. You get all those amazing programs. Go check them out. Go to mapsresponder.com. That's M-A-P-S responder.com. By the way, this promotion is going to end February 15th. So get on it right now. You know, I want to start uh, this episode by, well, we're going to be talking about first responders, but before we kind of get into, you know, their training and the things that the challenges they have to face and what that all looks like, uh, I want to thank them because uh, that is a tough job. Showing up first when shit goes down is insane. I have a, a friend who's a police officer, and I guess you could put them in this same category. And when I hang out with them, I have them tell me stories, and I'm always just like, how do you go to sleep when you go home? Like, how do you deal with that? And then imagine EMTs and firefighters and just the uh, just you just have to be made of something different to right. kind of handle that. You know They're I mean? more difficult clients to help too, because of their schedule, because of the mm -hmm. high stress, totally the long hours. Um, the crazy schedule that they have. Um, I, I've trained. I've trained a lot of firefighters, a lot of nurses, a lot of ER nurses, um, uh, police officers. Like, and they're they they run like crazy schedules, and they have very very stressful jobs, right? So that always presents a challenge when writing a program, when uh, putting together nutrition for them, uh, and it's not a lack of discipline or consistency from them because mm -hmm. they they all tend to have that. I feel mm -hmm. like like mm -hmm. it's. It's never like what I've always had to do is kind of help help them find that right balance yeah. for for their work what they what they're currently yeah doing. it's really stress management I mean it's a big part of it because they're you're bringing a lot of that uh, high adrenaline back home with them and then how can they you know uh, sort of turn that down a bit and then you know how do we work in with their schedule and then how do they also implement uh, fitness and everything else uh, properly yeah Pete so. You know, and you said stress management. I think a lot of, I think when you say stress management, people assume it means, you know, meditating and you know doing that kind of stuff, which is part of stress management. But there's another part of stress management, which is anything that is a stress on the body. You have to understand that they all pile up in the same bucket, right? So, mm -hmm. lack of sleep, stress and anxiety from work or from life, uh, illness, workouts, right? Workouts are a stress. So when you're training your body, and if you're a first responder, you for sure have to train your body for a couple different reasons. One, prevent injury. Injury rate's actually quite high in first responders. And two, to perform what you need to do. You have to be able to perform your job, which at times can be very demanding, but you have to manage this exercise stress on the body because they have so much other stress in their job and because their sleep is often so uh, inconsistent. I'm so glad often. you're bringing that up because that was always a challenge, right? Because I'd have I I recall having clients that would say like I don't have any stress, like I love my job. Mm -hmm. So you can love your job and love what you do, 
but and and don't feel like you have the the stress because you think like uh everyone like thinks stress and they think like you have a, a bad boss or your home life is so bad or you so hate you, it right exactly uh-huh. so so it's stressful it doesn't that it's not right at all a lack of sleep is stressing your body out adrenaline rush right if you got to save somebody's life and even if you you love that right you mm-hmm. enjoy it and it's it's so rewarding when you yeah, do it still affects you it's still high stress it is it's, I mean the, the body doesn't know the difference the body it, it recognizes it the same way that if you were completely stressed out, that's what you have to, you have to get across. To yes. Them. Now, now liking your stress means that it might have less of a mental impact, but the physical physical impact is actually quite similar. So, to give you an example, I love working out. It's one of my favorite things to do. Can I work out too much and put too much stress on my body? Of course, absolutely. Right. You you love sunbathing, so you don't feel negative about laying out in the sun. Can you do that too much? And cause your body too much stress. So it isn't, and I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm glad you said that. It's a great point because oftentimes people will they'll think the stress means that they feel negative about it. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're like, well, it's not stress to me because I love the excitement. I love that it's un- imp- unpredictable. I love that you know crazy stuff happens. Still, it's stress on the body. And your workouts, you have to take that into account. You have to take that into account. Not to mention the. For for most of these clients, okay, not everybody. I know overgeneralization to say all, but most of these clients that I would train that were first responders, they also have that mentality where they can switch it on and just grind and go because they have that. They work a sixteen hour mm-hmm. shift or mm-hmm. three days in a row. They work with like no sleep, and so because they have that, they sometimes will transfer that same that same thought process or mentality going into training. Totally. And that's where it's hard because you're, you, have, you have to teach them that, listen, that's a great discipline, right? To have that, you have that ability to get after it. But if we're going to train your body to respond and, and to change or to do what you want it to do, we need to work with it. And if you're getting after it at work like that and you got a lot of stress going on and then you go in the gym and your, and your workout reflects that type of high stress training, we're not going to see the results that you want to. So we got to learn to kind of ebb and flow. Yeah, you want the fitness to benefit your body. It, 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 you you want to like find that right dose that uh, will complement, uh, you know, a true change in, in a muscle building pathway versus just adding more stress onto the pile, which, you know, y- your body's going to end up fighting itself at that point. Yeah, the dose has to be appropriate. Actually, it doesn't matter who you're talking about, right? It can be anybody. The dose has to be appropriate. The appropriate dose of exercise, the appropriate application of exercise is going to maximize your results. Anything outside of that, anything outside of that, whether it's less than the appropriate dose or too much of the dose is going to result in reduced results. And if you go the further away you move from the appropriate dose for you, the less results you get. And in fact, if you continue to push outside of that, you'll start to get not just diminishing returns, but negative returns. And I've actually seen this in people who are in jobs like this. I've also trained people in this category, and I've seen them. You're right that they tend to apply that same- They're drawn to it. Right, and so then they do that with their workouts, and they're like, why am I feeling worse? Why is my strength going down? Yeah, and it's hard, too, a lot of times because of the schedule. Like, they're really tired, and they're just trying to catch up on sleep, or, you know, that this is a consideration of, you know, even training, it seems like it's, you know, it's too much taken away from their rest time. And so to be able to fit that in is really challenging, but you have to, like, approach it with a completely different mindset. Well, it reminds me. A, a lot of uh, training like ex-athletes they have that that similar mindset going into the way they work out my, my best friend's wife is a nurse and uh, she works the crazy 16 hours and super disciplined like and she's drawn to the orange theories the soul cycles the peloton the running marathons and she's uh, we i've known her for a long long time right my best friend and i go way back and they've been married for a long time and so she's always you know, she lived with me at one point too. It was uh, when, back when I was a trainer. So she's always reaching out and asking me nutrition questions and exercise questions. And I'm always having to tell her, I'm like, Janet, you, you are so drawn to this way of training. And I know you like it because you get the adrenaline rush, similar to probably what you get when you're saving somebody's life inside the hospital. But you need to understand that that's not what's best for your body. And it's so hard to get her out of that mindset and get her into this, you know, slower reps, longer rest periods, let's build strength, let's work on mobility. Hey, actually, you know what? This is the next day after you ran three 16s in a row. 
How about we do something more recuperative? Let's actually just do all mobility today or stretching work or maybe sauna or meditation today. And then the next, after you've gotten a full day's of rest, then we'll go after a good strength day the next day after that. So I'm always having to communicate that to her. Yeah. And again, if you do everything right, your body uh, moves forward, it responds and you feel uh, phenomenal. You know, that feeling of, of that, that, you know, stress feeling, right? Because you have an elevation in cortisol, you have uh, adrenaline that increases, it actually feels good. It does. It's, it's supposed to, by the way. Cortisol is not a, a bad a hor- a hormone. Everybody says, oh, cortisol is bad. No, it's not. It's, it's not bad. It's useful. And when cortisol is high, it, your body utilizes more energy. You get that fight or flight response, which is actually very useful when you need it, right? It also feels good. By the way, when people go on certain corticosteroids, which are similar to cortisone because it's anti-inflammatory, You'll hear them say, oh my gosh, I have so much energy. I feel so good, you know, mm-hmm. and all that mm-hmm. stuff. But also over time, if it's high all the time, it starts to break things down, starts to degrade things. It actually starts to promote fat storage, this indirect way of telling your body to store more calories because you're so stressed all the time. So if you're one of these people always in the state and you feel good, how do you elicit that state when you go to the gym? Well, you just hammer the hell out of yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, in the short term, Oh, I feel good all of a sudden. You know, I love those spin classes. I love that super intense stuff. Makes me feel good. And then, of course, a couple hours later, they feel like garbage again. And they try to go and and try to get that hit of drug again, that cortisol hit or whatever again. So you need to train appropriately. And there are unique challenges to people who are first responders. And that's a big one. That is a very big one. Yeah. And it's really important that you consider like strength training because there are so many examples and and Courtney used to work in the ER. Sometimes she'd float over there, but also just in her own job, like, like the most common injury was a lower back injury. Mm -hmm. And this is just moving patients and dead weight and being in that sort of position where you're, you're leaning over and you're picking things up in front of you that are very heavy and uh, you, you know, there's going to be a lot of those opportunities, especially when you're responding and somebody's, you know, passed out or whatever. Like you've got to make sure that you have the proper mechanics and the strength to to produce the right thing. Do you know that it was actually first responders that helped me unlock the secrets of full body training? Mm. Because it was I had to learn to adjust what my programming at the time, which looked very bodybuilderish. You know, I used to. Yeah, today's teach. legs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I used to run splits with my clients. It was whether it be a two part or a three part or a one uh, part uh, body part split. That's pretty much how I wrote programs for the first you know four or five years of training. But I kept running into this issue when I was training the firefighters or ER nurses that would run these sixteens or three days in a row or five on four off. Like I was like, shit, this messes up mm-hmm. my programming. Like all of a sudden they're going great and then it would break it up. And now we don't hit, you know, shoulders for a week and a half because they have to take these days off. And so the only answer to that was, you know, what I need to start doing is I need to start looking into like training full body. And up until that point, I really didn't dabble that much in it. And that was, and the funny part is they saw amazing results from this. And of course it still took me like another three, four years before it like fully registered for me. But this was the beginning of me starting to train my clients full body more often yeah. than I would do. Plus they don't have to live in the gym. Well, this solves a lot of the right. issues too and it, of the schedule. And if they miss a day or two, it's not a big deal. They, no. a, a week never goes by that at least everything doesn't get hit because we run a full body routine. It allows right. for flexibility. Yes. It, it totally does. So if, if you're working your full body and your schedule gets crazy or, oh my gosh, I need to get some sleep, you know you're going to hit every body part a couple days a week at least, right? If you're doing a split four days a week, and you miss one day, oh, I didn't get to work out my back. Oh, no, I missed my shoulders this week. And over the course of a year, you actually start to – you see, if you look at someone's schedule over the course of months or a year, that you miss a lot. There's a lot of imbalance in the way you're training. But if it's full body, it doesn't even have to be set schedule. In fact, this is how I would train mm-hmm. first responders. I wouldn't tell them you have to come Monday, Wednesday, Friday because their schedule will change so often. I, it would be more like when you come in, we're going to train your whole body. Right. And it would usually turn into two or three days a week of full body, which incidentally works best for most people anyway. Right. right? right. This is, it's this optimal. Is, it's optimal anyway. So it's a great way to keep yourself consistent in your workouts. Now, here's another piece of it, right? Full body encourages, because sometimes people think, oh my God, full body, that's like, a, I'm going to hammer myself. No, it doesn't. If you do it properly, full body workouts encourage you to train with more appropriate intensity because you're doing, let's say one typical full body workout would be one exercise per body part, let's say three sets each, right? You're not going to go you know, to failure 
on squats because you have to train your whole body. Right. So actually, naturally, it starts to encourage this kind of uh, appropriate use of intensity. And it feels very invigorating. It feels really good. You can get away with a two-day-a-week routine, full body, and do just fine. In fact, uh, you know, when I trained Doug, um, I trained him twice a week, full body. He's not a first responder. It's just how I trained him. For actually the first year we worked out and got tremendous results. Most people do. So if you're a first responder, you are far better off setting yourself with just a full body routine. So when you can make it to the gym, you're doing an exercise you know, per body part in, it, in your whole workout. It also opens the door for them to extend this uh, workout into like one long. So this would happen sometimes, right? So let's say... I've got a first responder and, you know, this is their off time. And so we have a great three day week of training and they, we hit our full body. We have our very similar to like anabolic, the way we split up the sets and reps. And then the next day comes or the next week comes and they're like, Adam, I'm running five straight or something. What do I do? So then all we would do is say, Hey, listen, I want you to rest and recover the day after the, that long, long work week. I want you to make sure you get recovery. Then the day after that, your second day that you have off, we're going to run a full body, but then I'm going to let you do eight sets of this and 10 sets of this and 12 sets of that. So they and it end up being an hour and a half, two hour workout that mm -hmm. they'd have, but that's okay because that's how we designed it. And then the next week after that, or two weeks later, we're back to the three or two. It just allows a lot more flexibility for me to coach them and keep their volume of training up and adjust it on the fly based off of their ever changing schedule. It's the most mm -hmm. flexible way uh, to train, and you know here. And there's also there's a psychological component here. Okay, so I don't I don't care who you are, I don't care how much you love to work out. You probably have body parts that you enjoy training more than others. Or to put it differently, there's definitely some body parts you don't like to train, uh, like you like to train the other body parts. When you follow a body part split and you have a stressful job that can make you exhausted, it's really easy to skip that body part, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a woman, in my experience, it was the arm workouts that you tend to, oh, today's just arms. I'm going to take today off. For guys, it was legs. Like, oh, legs. I'm going to go back. Up. I'll do it tomorrow when it's chest type of deal. When it's full body, it's full body. Mm -hmm. You don't miss train the, the, the whole body. And that balance is very important when you train your body, especially with the injury rate that you see with. Oh yeah, punch. and plus too, like when it's leg day or something like that, where it's like uh, more intense. A lot of times you can you can overreach, and uh, you know, and this sort of helps to manage that a bit better because you know, like there's going to be another workout. It's going to be very similar. We're going to hit the same group again, and so you're mindful of that, uh, carrying that into your your other workouts. Totally. The other thing that you should do when you work out, uh, and I recommend this for most people, right? Especially if you're a first responder is to focus on compound lifts because the functionality of the strength that you get in the gym is means it's something different for you than it does to the you know the desk the person that works at a desk in front of a computer you work in front of a computer on a desk you're when it comes to functional strength you know it's not that important like you're not going to test your body on a daily basis i mean you know you might lift a box of files you know once a month but that's about it otherwise you're clicking your mouse and typing on a keyboard mm. If you're a first responder, uh, not only are you testing your body, it's extremely unpredictable, right? Uh, you're, you, you're, you're lifting people, moving objects, you're twisting, you're turning, you're bending, you're stepping back, stepping up, moving over things that may be uneven or unbalanced. Um, you need your strength to translate to what you're doing in your job. Compound lifts do this, okay? Isolation movements do this far less, right? So, you know, if you want to work out your biceps, a pull-up is going to be way more applicable to your job than doing barbell curls. I feel like you need to break that down and simplify that even more because you're saying things like compound lifts, isolation, functional, which are all fitness terms. Yeah. Like, what does that mean to a in, a person that's just getting into exercise and hears you saying that? Like, what the fuck does that mean to them? Is, is it, What kind of exercises well, are you talking about? Yeah, think of it like uh, really using your stabilizing muscles uh, versus not. So if I'm in an isolated type of an exercise, a lot of the machines will take that role. They will allow you to place your arms down and you know you don't have to hold your arms up in certain positions like a, a curl for instance and you know that's something that the, the machine now takes that role whereas if you're standing up now i have to stabilize my body i have to make sure everything is you know bracing properly and you know protecting my yeah. joints so that's that's something that has value in terms of functional strength yeah to put it plainly uh compound lifts utilize more than one joint in your body it's typically as defined but they're just big movements so 
you know, uh, a leg extension would be working out my legs, but I'm in a chair and I'm just using my knees. A squat is also working my legs, but I'm bending my knees, my mm-hmm. hips, my ankles, uh, my back. I have weight on my back. So it's a bigger movement. It's a gross motor. It's known as a gross motor movement, meaning I'm using a lot of different muscles. It mimics real movement. And they tend to be free weight, right? They tend to not be in machines. Compound lifts can be done in machines, but the free weight ones are even more functional because uh, obviously if you're helping someone lift someone, do it, you know, something in the real world, it's probably not on a track or attached to a cable. It's probably free, you know, uh, like a free weight would be. So compound lifts are what a majority of your workout uh, should look like. So, Did you guys have favorite exercises and favorite compound lifts that you like to teach? Oh, I th- Overhead press. So I overhead press is great for uh, first responders. I'd get them good at deadlifts. Mm-hmm. I'd get them really squats. good at squats. Um, I'd get them really good at rows. Turkish get up. Turkish get up is Zercher great. squats, deadlifts. Those those all those movements I think are like oh, Zercher is great, right? right. For uh, for functionality because you're care- if you're holding someone close to your body in front of you. Yeah, I like Turkish get because here's the thing: it's it's about organizing your body. It's about having full control of your body. And I think that people like don't really consider that a lot with training. Uh, you, there's a way that you can communicate better throughout your body. And I think that's super valuable for somebody like a first responder. Well, yeah. we, we have a lot, we have a couple of friends that, uh, you know, we, we, that tease the whole, uh, I've seen them tease the Zercher squad. I've seen them tease the, uh, you know, Turkish get up, but here is a, a classic example of where, um, I would argue this, and I would say that this this is where it has tremendous value because it's very specific to the client. You're talking about first responders. You're talking about people that are going to potentially be picking people up off the ground or grabbing heavy things and moving them. Something moves away from them. It's pulling their body out of position. They have right. to be able to get back to stabilize it. Right, and so getting that person to be able to squat 600 pounds in the sagittal plane uh, is less valuable to me than them being able to control like a 50-pound a kettlebell over their head while they do a Turkish get-up. To me, that's more that, that will have more carryover into the things that they will be doing in real life than them just heavy loading something. And so this is where this I think these types of movements have tremendous value. I said the Zercher, and Sal, you echoed that, right? Like uh, how often are, are you going to be grabbing things and picking things up in front of you if you're a first responder? Most all the time. Yeah. And how many exercises in the gym have you doing that? There's not yeah. a lot of exercises where you load the front of your body and you're holding on to something while you squat or lunge or hinge. Yeah, yeah. heavy uh, farmer walks are probably good too. Uh, you need to have a pretty strong grip um, and stabilization. Stabilize your spine while you have load mm-hmm. on your body. Uh, th- these are the kinds of exercises you should focus on. Now, here's the other side of this. This is this is a cool side of this. All those exercises are also the best at building a uh, nice physique. So here's the side effect of doing all those compound lifts, besides being functional at work, is your body actually visibly starts to change. And the reason why I'm saying that is I know first responders are also interested in looking good, right? Those are also the most effective exercises for making your body look good. I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because that was another hurdle I remember having a lot. Because I'd have, especially my firefighters, my firefighter guys that I train would be like, they want to look jacked, they want to look this certain way. You're like, man, you're already a firefighter. <laughs> we got a calendar coming yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah. I totally have buddies that like that. That uh, they so they so I like that you brought that up because there's this this idea that if I have you doing, you know, Turkish get-ups yeah. or, you know, l- Zercher lunges or something that you are not going to get jacked to look awesome doing those exercises. They build tremendous muscle, burn a ton of body fat too. Those are great exercises, but they also have more carryover into what you're going to be doing at work all day. So I, I remember having to communicate that all the time because they see magazines, they see bodybuilders, they see the routines that they are. And they're mm-hmm. like, I want that physique. It's like, listen, we can build a physique like that. You know, maybe not like to a bodybuilder who's on stage, but you can have an amazing looking aesthetic physique physique, but still do these functional type movements that are not your traditional bodybuilder exercises. And I remember having to communicate that a lot. Totally. Now, uh, here's one of the challenges, right? With uh, being a first responder, somebody has this kind of a demanding job is that in your job, uh, most often the movements that you have to do, the things that you have to do with your body are not uh, good form movements. What I mean by that is they don't tend to resemble um, perfect form in the gym with an exercise. It mm-hmm. can be very unexpected, you know? 
a deadlift is in front of me and I'm lifting the weight up off the floor, but what if I'm lifting something and I can't do it right in front of me? There's something in the way and I got to twist and move to the side. Or what if I'm lifting something that's imbalanced? Yes. Or what if I have to reach up or over something? Or the weight moves. Or the weight moves, right. Or I'm reaching up over something, I'm on my toes and I'm kind of twisting, right? Mm-hmm. So how in the hell can I prepare my body to be strong and stable in almost an infinite possibilities of unexpected movements, right? One thing you could do is you can go in the gym and construct a fire scene and try and strengthen your body in that, but that's not going to work very well, right? Because like I said, there's infinite possibilities. Here's the better strategy. The better strategy is to work on mobility. In fact, mobility training should be the priority for people in jobs like this. Now, to, to explain what mobility is, I don't just mean range of motion. I don't just mean you're flexible. That's part of mobility. Part of mobility is having good flexibility. But the other part of mobility is just as important, which is to have stability and strength within that range of motion. So to give you an example, um, my I, I have an infant son. He's, he's not even four months old. I could probably put him in the splits, right? So he's flexible. He's a baby. He's totally flexible. But is he stable in that position? Can he hold himself? If I put any weight on him, even his body weight in a split position, he might risk actually dislocating a joint or yeah, injuring or himself. Or he'd tip over. Or he'd tip over, right? So you need the flexibility, but what you all, what you need even more is stability and strength in all the ranges of motion that your joint can provide. That way, when you're in a situation where you have to reach real quick or mm-hmm. twist and bend, you're not just able to get in that position because you're flexible, but you're also able to stabilize yeah. and prevent injury yeah. because Support your body. the injury rate is very high with first responders. That's usually due to slips, falls, or it's due to lifting or moving something that causes you to pull something in your back is actually more, one of the more common places. The truth is, this is true for everybody, mm-hmm. but it's just exaggerated with first responders. It's really true because, for them. Yeah, because of how often they're doing these things, right? I mean, don't you guys remember with clients, the injuries were never, I was deadlifting 400 pounds at him yesterday and I tweaked mm-hmm. my back. It was- He was in the shower. Yeah, I was in the shower picking up a shampoo bottle or I was reaching back to grab my kid, you know, was doing, you know, spilling something in the back of the car or I had to move real quick because my kid almost fell down the steps. It's always like something like that, right? Nothing crazy heavy or challenging. They just had to move dynamically in a way that they haven't been training and then they get hurt. Now- that's just, those are random accidents with normal people, and that's why they should train that. When you're talking about first responders, that's like every day of their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That shit's happening where they got to pick somebody up and move them from a bed to another bed or grab and catch somebody or carry somebody. Like, So it's just, I mean, it's just 10x exaggerated yeah. that these people have to be doing and to that. to echo that in the mobility talk, like it, what that provides is just to... to uh, get the body to be familiar, to familiarize, uh, you know, yourself in these different positions. And so to to be able to react properly is everything. It's going to help you from preventing these injuries, but also it's going to it's going to provide that strength when you need it. So if I'm if my body's in kind of a weird position, you know, it's better to be able to you know have some familiarity there uh, to be able to get yourself out properly and safely. Yeah, injuries happen when you move outside of your body's control and capacity. I know that sounds obvious, but here's what's not so obvious. You can be really strong and injure yourself doing something that uh, seems easy, uh, like Adam was saying, turning in the car to, to, to grab your kid, or you moved a little too fast laterally. The reason why they injured themselves doing those things is because it was outside of their own body's capability. In, in essence, they, didn't, they don't control that movement. They didn't own that movement. That's the only time you hurt yourself, by the way. they don't train it. Right. So if you own lots of ranges of motion, if you own lots of possible movements through mobility, this is what mo- mobility uh, movements and exercise and practice actually does, you're shrinking the possibility of injuring yourself. You're actually making that possibility smaller and smaller and smaller. And to give you another example, some of the most injury prone people I've ever met in my entire life were really strong bodybuilder types. Oh yeah. Very muscular, very strong, could bench press over 300 pounds, could yeah. squat over Lots 400 pounds. Lots of capacity for strength, but you know, just a little angle difference and then boom. Oh, totally. I have I, I happened to a friend of mine years ago. He's big strong bodybuilder and was we were walking and the he stepped off a step, didn't realize that 
His step was gonna, his foot was gonna go off the step. Step down, boom, hurt his his back just from doing that. Here's a guy that could deadlift almost 600 pounds, and he stepped off the step and hurt himself. And it was only because it was outside of his body's capability. In fact, getting really strong sometimes can make it even worse because you move stronger with more force outside of that capability and cause problems. Mobility work. Uh, helps to erase that. And if you're a first responder, this should be a priority. Mobility work should be a part of your routine. especially And also priming, right? So setting your workouts up. So that's also really important. So you have somebody who's in a job where whether they're sitting or they're standing still in a position all the time or they're always bending over a certain way, if you go right into a workout without setting your, your setting your joints up, setting your body up, priming your body for that workout, you end up just tightening, 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 and that also increases the risk of injury. So mobility work, you want to be doing on the off days of training or integrating that some throughout your day, and then making sure when you go into your training session, priming the body correctly and getting it set to have a successful workout. Yeah, so priming is like warming up before your workout, but except specific. way yeah. more targeted and way more effective. The aim isn't just to reduce injury in your workout, but rather increase the effectiveness of the exercise you're doing by by turning on your muscles in ways that allow them to fire Placing more your joints in favorable positions so that way you know you're going to perform at your best. Absolutely. Uh, now here's the next thing, and this is extremely important because what is most demanding, you know, from the first responders that I know, um, it some it usually looks like this uh, that their job is quiet and dead. Or extremes, like no, there's only there's only two things. And when there's extreme, yeah. they get tested uh, for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and and what you need for that is a lot of stamina and a lot of durability. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if it's it's one thing to be strong for thirty minutes or for three minutes, it's another thing to be able to maintain your performance when you're in a situation that is three hours or four hours or. 24 hours. You know, here in California, we had fires oh, yeah. uh, that were just raging uh, months ago. And some of those firefighters were out there for days yeah. doing stuff. Weeks. And, and you need stamina and durability to, in order to perform that without destroying your body. Well, here's another example of training somebody for their specific needs, right? So that that message would be counter to uh, the most ideal way to put on the most muscle on this client. Well, okay. That's important, right? We want to build muscle. I know this client wants to look a certain way too, but I also have to take into consideration that they have times with their job where they are going to have to go for three hours straight. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that I program, I want to program stamina in there and durability into their program design for that specific reason, knowing that it's going to, that doesn't apply to every, everybody all the time. If I have a client comes into me and they want to build all this muscle, they don't have a job like that. That's a component that might get left out. But because this person is going to be having to tap into that on a regular basis, and I care about their well-being, in addition to building muscle for them, I'm going to build that into the program. Right, and it's and here's the difference between what we're talking about, stamina and durability versus endurance. Endurance would be like uh, lung capacity, would be running for you know long distance at slow paces, which is very, uh, that's not what it looks like for a first responder typically. Typically what they're doing is they're, Either like if like we talked about the firefighters are hiking mm-hmm. for hours, they're so they're carrying really they're heavy stuff, carrying heavy things. They're, your hands get beat up because you're holding tools or you're manipulating things, or right. you have to push things away. You know, throughout the throughout the hours that you're doing stuff, or you're carrying people. It's a di- it's a durability. You have to be yeah. tough yeah. In, in your body. Different than like I can just run for you know oh, for six miles. I in like a row. durability as the term. I also like work capacity, and that's just really like we're trying to build the gas tank that that fuels the the machine, and so that's that's something we just want to have more ability to keep going and keep working through a lot of the you know it, a lot of the the you know the 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 load that you're carrying. Yeah. You know, another thing too when you're talking about durability is one of the limiting factors or most common limiting factor that I would see with clients is their grip and hand strength. 100%. So I'm always making sure that I'm programming that in there. It's just one of those overlooked things that you wouldn't think that that's that important. But because a lot of the jobs uh, require good grip strength, and when you're doing something, when you're carrying a body for distance or you're lugging gear, like you're saying, for over a mountain, like the not only do you have to be durable and be able to get through there, but you also need to be hold on to stuff. And so grip strength becomes yeah, really the, the important. The two things you need durability in the most are uh, core durability, because your core starts to fail, especially if you're carrying things for long distances or whatever. 
And then, like you said, Adam, yeah. your hands. But that's if, your insurance, your core, right? Yes. You're protecting your spine. Right, right. But if you can't hold on to something, here's the other side, the other part of the hand one. You can't hold on to something. You can't lift it. I don't right. care how strong your legs right. are, how strong your back is. If you can't hold on, you are done. You and can't do the work. You would be surprised at how many people that work out in the gym on a regular basis whose hand strength does not match the strength of their back or their legs. In mm -hmm. fact, it's so common there's lifting uh, you know, tools that help people with that. They, you know, wrist wraps, for example, or straps, a very, very common tool that a lot of like regular lifters use all the time because their hands just can't match the well, strength. And, and the here is an example, right? So we've debated this actually a lot, right? Because I, I use straps, although I haven't used them in a long time. Um, I have used straps in my workouts. Here's an example, though, where even somebody like me who is uh, a fan of that as a tool here and there, this is where this person that's cannot be in my program. It's like, mm -hmm. no, because I don't care if you can get uh, 50 more pounds on your deadlift if you can't hold on to the bar because that doesn't make sense for what we're doing. It doesn't translate. Yeah. I don't get, if talking to a bodybuilder who's trying to build a specific part and develop something, okay, you can make that case to me where that makes sense. But if you're somebody like this, where your grip strength is is it, it could be a major limiting factor in you being able to perform your job, I don't give a shit if you can't lift 50 more pounds, if, and you could if you had straps on your hand, I, I need to get your grip strength stronger. Absolutely. So the four things you want to consider for your routine, if you are a first responder, or even if you're trying to become a first responder, uh, just to recap, you want to do full body workouts. You want to focus on those compound lifts. You want to definitely do mobility work, and you want to work on durability and stamina. So here's what we did, right? So we have workout programs that uh, address all the things that we just talked about. Um, there's a few in particular. There's MAPS Prime. We talked earlier about priming your body. There's also a correctional component to that. Uh, MAPS Performance is our athletic-based training program. Um, MAPS Strong you are going to do a lot of weird and odd and different lifts to give you that kind of functional strength. And then MAPS OCR, which was designed for obstacle course racers, but you want to talk about durability, that program develops durability. And what we've done is we put them all together for a limited time in a first responder bundle. Uh, normally, if you put all those programs together at retail, it's over $500. What we've done for you guys is we've made it $159.99, and you can get all those programs. They're all included in there. And of course, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, just go check that out at our on our site, mapsresponder.com. That's M-A-P-S, responder.com. By the way, this all ends February 15th. That'll be the last day that we're offering this special bundle for first responders. Wrong. You can look at, you can speculate on what's going to happen in the future and how it's going to suck. No, no, no. Don't do that. Just literally take the energy, it's just energy, and and just shift it about three feet over here and start looking at how you can make this work for you. It's just 